Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Hutchinson, for those wonderful words and for inviting me to speak here. And thank you for the, uh, your letter of invitation to me to come and join you for this occasion. <clears throat> my, uh, one of my friend has a, 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 a sort of uh, benchmark for deciding on the length of his speech. And he says, farther I go from my place of stay, the speech becomes longer. And guess, I came from New York. So be ready for a long speech. Uh, just kidding. I hope that, not be, that would not be that long. But anyway, I have so many things to share. But I will be focusing on two major pursuits of mine, which I had the honor of initiating uh, when I was ambassador of Bangladesh. One is how, uh, what the chancellor mentioned, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, recognizing women's role in peace and security. And the other is the concept of the culture of peace which uh, makes it in incumbent on us to make peace part of our daily life. Distinguished Chancellor of the University of Sydney, Belinda Hutchinson, Chairman of the International House Council, Dr. Steve Mark, Suiha, President, Dr. Ross Madden, International House Members Association's outgoing chair, Stephen Sanders, International House Director, Ms. Jessica Carroll, who had been most helpful, supportive during our stay here, and also in preparing for my visit to this place. I have the pleasure to acknowledge the presence, as uh, Ms. Carroll did, the presence of Acting High Commissioner of Bangladesh to Australia, Ms. Farida Yasmin, and her spouse, Gulam Sabir. And of course, my most supportive, most caring life partner, Mariam Charles. Let me also have the pleasure of recognizing the presence of my adorable niece, my only sister's only daughter, Miss Nondita Yusuf, and her husband, George. Joining from Canberra, and my dear cousin, Shamima Ara, joining from Sydney. It is a distinct honor to be invited as the keynote speaker of the gala culminating event of the year-long celebration of the 50th anniversary of the International House of the prestigious University of Sydney. I'm particularly delighted as this International House, and for that matter, all International Houses in other universities is a place where students can learn to relate to other people from other parts of the world, respectfully debate differences in values and cultures, learn more about world issues, and really begin to become true global citizens. And it is wonderful for me to stand in front of all these flags decorating the podium. It, it's like a mini United Nations. There uh, you have 193 flags uh, of countries. It is inspiring to note it's the I House's assertion that, and I quote here, which I got um, from your annual report. It says, as we have come to live in international house with people from many lands, we pledge ourselves to support the aim that understanding and peace may prevail, end of quote. It is also fascinating
to know that your residents hail from every continent of the world. And 22% of the countries of the world are represented in the house living and learning together. I am very impressed by Sydney University's International House Program of Activities, which includes its global leadership program, social and cultural events, peer learning and support, its roundtable discussion, as well as its scholarships and grants program, which covers the remarkable Davis Projects for Peace initiative. And I was uh, talking to one of the, the project leaders, and I was telling him that he came from India, joined by a Bangladeshi to prepare a peace project in Madagascar. And that is really remaining globally connected. That's wonderful. Let me emphasize that anniversaries are meaningful when they trigger a renewed enthusiasm amongst all. I'm happy to note that your vision for the future is to expand the house to offer more places, which will provide students with the opportunity to participate in and obtain a truly unique IH experience. To achieve this, your aim is to develop a large state-of-the-art facility for 500 plus residents on campus. Wonderful. You have my sincere best wishes for that. If any lobbying is needed, <laughs> call me. My own life has been shaped over the last half century by various realities, particularly my challenges, struggles, and difficulties. Throughout, my life has been my family has been my greatest strength. Defying all obstacles, as a young Pakistani diplomat, I was inspired to join the liberation war for Bangladesh and engaged as a freedom fighter to mobilize global support for our sovereign existence as a nation. I am deeply humbled by the opportunity to represent and lead my country at the United Nations and thereafter become the first Under Secretary General from Bangladesh at the United Nations headquarters. My life's experience has taught me to value peace and equality as the essential component of our existence. They unleash the positive forces of good that are so needed for human progress. My initiatives at the United Nations General Assembly in 1999 on the culture of peace, in the Security Council in 2000 on equality of women's participation, and in leading the UN system's prioritization of the needs of the world's most vulnerable countries as their champion for six years, all show that when head and heart join together to do something big and worthwhile for humanity, no obstacle is insurmountable. My work has taken me to the farthest corners of the world from Sierra Leone to Sri Lanka, from Mongolia to Mauritius, from Bhutan to the Bahamas to Burkina Faso, from Paraguay to the Philippines, from Kosovo to Kazakhstan. I have seen time and again the centrality of the culture of peace and women's equality in our lives. This realization has now become more pertinent in the midst of the ever-increasing militarism and militarization that is destroying both our planet and our people. Peace is integral to human existence. 
in everything we do, in everything we say, and in every thought we have. There is a place for peace. We should not isolate peace as something separate. We should know how to relate to one another without being unpleasant, without being violent, without being disrespectful, without neglect, without prejudice. Once we are able to do that, we are able to take the next step forward in building the culture of peace. We need to focus on empowering the individual so that each one of us becomes individually an agent of peace and nonviolence. It is important to realize that the absence of peace takes away the opportunities that we need to better ourselves, to prepare ourselves, to empower ourselves, to face the challenges of our lives individually and collectively. The essence of the culture of peace is its message of self-transformation and it is its message of inclusiveness, of global solidarity, and of the oneness of humanity. These elements, individual and global, individual to global, constitute the culture of peace. Everybody can talk about and create the culture of peace because it lives in our communities and in each one of us. We do not have to become a peace studies experts or street protesters or a Nobel Peace Laureate to make a difference. We just have to leave our own mark on this world as a peaceful individual. The United Nations was born in 1945 out of the Cold War, out of the World War II. The UN Declaration and Program of Action on Culture of Peace was born in 1999 in the aftermath of the Cold War. I was distinctly honored to chair the nine month long negotiations that produced the United Nations Declaration and Program of Action on the Culture of Peace. And this is the booklet I flash every time I talk about it. It contains that declaration and program of action. For last two decades, my focus has been on advancing the culture of peace. And I have continued to devote considerable time, energy, and effort to do that. The declaration and program of action is a unanimously adopted document explaining outlining and defining everything that the international community has agreed on as the focus of the culture of peace. And I would recommend all of you to Google it and get, uh, get to read it. I want to underscore one particular aspect in this context. In the culture of peace movement, we are focusing more attention on children as that contributes in a major way to the sustainable and long-lasting impact on our societies. A children's tendency, a child's tendency toward either violent aggressiveness or nonviolence begins to take shape as early as, believe it or not, four or five years. That is why the culture of peace movement is focusing increasingly on children growing up as peaceful and nonviolent individuals. UNICEF has taken the lead by integrating many elements of the culture of peace into its work, including the establishment and formation of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium in 2013. We have seen a rise in engagement on the culture of peace. Since the first one 
was convened by the General Assembly in President in 2012. The subsequent presidents of the General Assembly have convened annually the United Nations High Level Forum on the Culture of Peace. The sixth annual forum in September this year focused on the theme, and I quote, sowing the seeds of the culture of peace, early childhood development is the beginning. And this attracted a high profile attention from the UN community. As uh, Chancellor mentioned about the Sustainable Development Goals, in September 2015, the United Nations agreed to adopt 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with 17 global goals. Goal four, focusing on education, aims to ensure inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning. More encouraging is the fact that target seven of this particular goal on education mentioned that all learners should acquire knowledge to promote, among others, the culture of peace and nonviolence and global citizenship. Civil society has done the most to advance the cause of the culture of peace. Individuals, as the core of civil society, have also done a lot, especially as educators at all levels. I have great pleasure teaching the culture of peace as a learning cluster course at the Soka University of America in California, regularly since 2009. The culture of peace as an expression is being referenced more and more in political and civil society statements. Also encouraging is to find that there are a number of educational institutions that have taken the initiative to put global citizenship at the core of their activities. The World Summit of Educators, which convened in 2016, is one such initiative worthy of attention of the institutions of learning. The same university where I teach has taken the lead in 2014 by launching an annual event called Dialogue on the Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, held every year on the UN proclaimed International Day of Nonviolence on 2nd of October, which is also the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. Let us remember that work for peace is a continuous process. Each one of us can make a difference in that process. Peace cannot be imposed from outside. It must be realized from within. Seeds of peace exist in all of us. They must be nurtured, cared for, and promoted by us all to flourish and flower. One soul-stirring inspiration that I have experienced from my work for the culture of peace is that we should never forget that when women, half of the world's seven plus billion people, are marginalized, there is no chance for our world to get sustainable peace in the real sense. It is my strong belief that unless women are engaged in advancing the culture of peace at equal levels at all times with men, sustainable peace would continue to elude us. Women bring a new breath, quality, and balance of vision to a common effort of moving away from the cult of war towards the culture of peace. Women's equality makes our planet safe and secure. Two 
most significant developments since the 1995 Fourth World Conference on Women under the United Nations umbrella in Beijing have been the adoption of the United Nations Security Council history-making resolution 1325. And thank you for flashing the pin on 1325. And the resolution is titled Women and Peace and Security, an agreement on the inclusion of an autonomous, self-standing goal for women's equality and empowerment in the Sustainable Development Goals. That is goal number five. Even Security Council Resolution 1325, and popularly that resolution is just four numerals, but it means much more than that. It is very close to my intellectual existence and my very small contribution to a better world for each one of us. To trace back 17 years ago on the International Women's Day in 2000, as the president of the Security Council, following extensive stonewalling, particularly from the permanent members of the Security Council, I was able to issue an agreed statement that formally brought to global attention the role and contribution women, uh, women have been making towards prevention of conflict and building of peace which had remained unrecognized, underutilized, and undervalued by the Security Council since its existence. The Council recognized that in that statement that peace is inextricably linked with equality between women and men, and affirmed the value of full and equal participation of women at all decision-making levels. That is when the seeds for Resolution 1325 was sown. The formal resolution followed on 31st of October of the same year following this conceptual and political breakthrough. Adoption of 1325 opened a much-awaited door of opportunity for women who have shown time and again that they bring a qualitative improvement in structuring peace and in post-conflict architecture. When women participate in peace negotiations and in the crafting of a peace agreement, they have the broader and longer-term interest of the society in mind. We recall that in choosing the three women laureates for the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize. The citation referred to 1325, saying that, and I quote, it underlined the need for women to become a participant on an equal footing with men in peace processes and in peace work in general, end of quote. The Nobel Committee further asserted that, and I quote again, we cannot achieve democracy and lasting peace in the world unless women obtain the same opportunities as men to influence development at all levels of society." End of quote. 1325 is the only UN resolution so specifically noted in any citation of the Nobel Peace Prize. Much nevertheless remains to be done. The driving force behind 1325 is participation. The main question is not to make war safe for women, but to structure the peace in a way that there is no recurrence of war and conflict. That is why women need to be at the peace tables Women need to be involved in the decision-making to ensure real and faithful implementation of 1325. 
gender perspectives must be fully integrated into the terms of reference of peace operations by the United Nations. A no tolerance, no impunity approach is a must in cases of sexual exploitation and abuse by the United Nations and regional peacekeepers. United Nations is welcomed in countries as the protectors, but they cannot afford to become perpetrators. I also believe that the historic and operational value of the resolution as the first international policy mechanism that explicitly recognized the gendered nature of war and peace processes has been undercut by the disappointing record of its implementation. Particularly for the lack of national level commitments. We are astounded by the complicity of the Security Council in international practices that makes women insecure, basically as a result of its support to the existing militarized interstate security arrangements. I am referring to the concept of security based on traditional outmoded strategic power structure rather than on human security, which highlights the security of the people. I believe strongly that we would not have to be worrying about countering extremism if women have equality in decision making, enabling them to take measures which would prevent such extremism. I recall Eleanor Roosevelt's words when she said, and I quote, too often the great decisions are originated and given shape in the bodies made up wholly of men, or so completely dominated by them that whatever of special value women have to offer is shunted aside without expression. End of quote. It is a reality that politics, more so security, is a man's world. Empowering women's political leadership will have ripple effects on every level of society and the global condition. When politically empowered, women bring important and difficult different skills and perspectives to the policy-making table in comparison to their male counterparts. Here I pay tribute to the role that Australia's women leadership played in the creation of the United Nations and in its formal recognition from the outset of women's rights. As an Australian delegate to the 1945 San Francisco Conference, Jesse Street participated directly in negotiating the UN Charter. Here it is. Which is the first international agreement to affirm the principle of equality between women and men. The advocacy of Jesse Street and the small band of women from other delegations resulted in explicit references to equality between women and men in the Charter's preamble and various other articles, as well as the inclusion of Article 8, that is specifically Jesse Street's contribution, which asserted the unrestricted eligibility of both women and men to the work for the United Nations itself. Patriarchy and misogyny are humanity's dual scourges, pulling back the humanity away from our aspiration for a better world to live in freedom, equality, and justice. We need not waste time by digging into the statistical labyrinth to show that women are unequal. Gender inequality 
is an established, proven, and undisputed reality. It is all pervasive. It is a real threat to human progress. Unless we confront these vicious and obstinate negative forces with all our energy, determination, and persistence, our planet will never be a desired abode for one and all. I will emphasize in that connection that none of the 17 sustainable development goals will make headway in any real sense until we make progress in realizing the objectives of women's equality and empowerment. So every other goal depends on what we do on goal five. Gender equality is a fundamental matter of human rights, democracy, and social justice, and is also a precondition for sustainable growth, welfare, peace, and security. Increasing gender equality has positive effects on food security, extremism, health, education, and numerous other key global concerns. We are experiencing around the globe an organized and determined rollback of the gains made so far, as well as new attacks on women's equality and empowerment. Yes in all parts of the world and in all countries without exception. As underscored by the architect of feminist foreign policy, Foreign Minister Margot Wallström of Sweden, she said, and I quote her, no society is immune from backlashes, especially not in relation to gender. There, are, there is a continuous need for vigilance and for continually pushing for women's rights and girls' full enjoyment of human, those human rights." End of quote. We have also noticed that the euphoria of women following the fall of their regressive regimes in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, was short-lived. Targeted and brutally brutal pushback is happening in those countries. Activist women find themselves lost with no pockets of support from society, which fail to recognize how in countless ways women, holds the, women hold the key to a stable, peaceful, and prosperous Middle East. Unfortunately, the emerging male-dominated leadership in those countries seem to forget that, and I quote from a report, democracy without equality in all aspects of the law and full participation of the 50% of the population is another form of authoritarianism, end of quote. That global reality is dramatically evidenced in the fact that UN itself, despite being the biggest champion of women's equality, has failed to elect a woman secretary general last year to reverse the historical injustice of having the post occupied by men for its entire seven decades of existence. Globally, only one in five parliamentarians is a woman, and there are nearly 40 countries in which women account for less than 10% of parliamentarians. This marginalization of women from political sphere is unfortunate and unacceptable. As I always strongly emphasize, empowering women's political leadership will have ripple effects on every level of society and global condition, which I said earlier also. When politically empowered, I'll skip that part, I will say that when women, and it is a sentence I use often, when women join politics, they want to do something. When men join politics, they want to be something. <laughs> Reiterating this assertion 
the UN Secretary General, the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, in his message on the International Women's Day, said very succinctly, and I quote, the truth is that North and South, East and West, and I am not speaking about any society, culture, or country in particular, everywhere we still have a male-dominated culture, end of quote. I join humbly my voice to Foreign Minister Wallstrom's assertion on the eve of this year's International Women's Day. She said, and I quote, feminism is a component of a modern view on global politics, not an idealistic departure from it. It is about smart policy, which includes whole populations, uses all potential, and leaves no one behind. Change is possible, necessary, and long overdue. End of quote. I am proud to be a feminist. All of us need to be. That is how we make our planet a better place, to live for all. We should always remember that without peace, development is impossible. Without development, is peace is not achievable. But without women, neither peace nor development is conceivable. Before I conclude, I would like to address the students of the International House directly. I would ask you, the students, to look into yourselves. In a world where material pursuits seems to be be all and end all of human endeavor. Find a real, real space for spirituality in your lives. In your eagerness to get something quickly, never sell, never ever sell your soul. I am confident that you will make every effort to read yourselves and your fellow men and women of the evils of intolerance and prejudice. Ignorance and selfishness that compel us to repeat this cycle of discrimination, prejudice, and violence. Your positive goals for yourself should not be pursued at the expense of other people. Recognize and value the positive in others. Recognize your mistakes and take responsibility for those. Do not find a scapegoat for your own failures. Confidence is essential, but it should not be misplaced. Do not be dogmatic to stagnate. Be flexible to move ahead. I am always inspired by the human spirit and its resilience and capacity to overcome any adversity. You are all aware that the hardest problems on the planet will not have these singular solutions, nor will they resolve, be resolved with singular attempts. Those must be worked on diligently collaboratively with perseverance and patience. I would like to end this rather longish speech with two quotations. So bear with me for a moment. One day, which I am very fond of was by Albert Einstein, when he said, the world is a dangerous place to live not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who do not do anything about it. And the students, it is your responsibility, it is our responsibility to do whatever we can ourselves. And that's very important. Let me end by quoting Mahatma Gandhi, the great apostle of peace. And he said, the day the power of love overrules the love of power. 
the world will know peace. Thank you. Uh, I have the honor of being able to thank Ambassador Chowdhury for that wonderful and inspirational speech, and I do so while flashing my 1525 banks that he also gave me, uh, and Belinda and Jessica. What we've heard today is not only a statement of a life's mission and an important mission for peace, it is really the mission of International House. And it is so important that we've had you here to actually articulate that mission in such a way that we are familiar with, comfortable with, etc., We've had thousands of students come to and live and experience a time of peace and a time of inclusion and a time of diversity. They're now spread throughout the world, mm -hmm. sharing that message that you have also shared with us today. So I want to just, on behalf of everyone here who have heard this inspirational and hopeful speech, at a time when not everything is so hopeful, I'd like to say thank you very much and present you with a small gift. Ah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.